Okay. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and you're all very, very welcome to uh, this webinar, which has been organised again by the Chagas uh, Horticultural Development Department. My name's Andy Welton, and uh, I'm your host here this evening, and with me I've got uh, my colleague Owen Sweetnam. Um, tonight's focus is, uh, is pumpkins. Um, it's a crop that appears to be growing in popularity, certainly amongst the retail sector in the last few years. And we've seen, you know, an interest in it, particularly in the last couple of years since the pandemic in the whole, uh, you know, pick your own and that whole farm tourism side of the house. Um, my own experience is, is kind of mixed. I think with pumpkins, you can have good years and bad years and an awful lot of it depends on the weather. But look, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we've been, we're joined tonight by an expert in the whole area, and that's um, um, horticultural specialist, a uh, ADAS's Chris Creed from Cheshire in the northwest of England. Welcome to Chris. And Chris is here to you know, shine a bit of a light on the whole crop and share some of his vast experience in, 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 in working with, with pumpkins over the years. Uh, Chris has been with ADAS since 1975 and he's over 40 years experience in the whole advisory and trials work area across a number of disciplines in commercial horticulture. I met Chris first about 30 years ago and worked with him for a short time. He was well known at that time for his expertise in soft fruit amongst the whole range of other crops. And over the years he's been the ADAS specialist in a number of, a number of key crops and one of those was rhubarb. And I remember Chris being involved in the early development work in Stockbridge House Experimental Station in Yorkshire. Um, it's now Stockbridge Technology Centre and he still works very closely with, with that sector. Uh, for the past 30 years, Chris has been the key advisor to growers in the northwest of the UK and uh, in North Wales. He's worked on many, many horticultural projects uh, funded by organisations like the AHDB, DEFRA, and a number of others. He's been involved in IPM work, predator breeding, farm environment management, and the host of other projects, you know, with too many to mention here tonight. But I think it's safe to say there isn't much that this man hasn't seen or experienced in, in the horticultural front over the years. So as I said, he's the ADA specialist in a couple of key crops, and one of those is pumpkins, which is our subject tonight. He works with large growers, small growers, medium growers, the whole gamut across the UK. And Chris is here tonight to share some of his uh, vast experience in growing and dealing with the crop. So before Chris, we'll, we'll have you speak. Um, we've, we're just going to run a short poll just to get you guys uh, engaged with us. And uh, I'm just gonna ask Owen if he wouldn't mind just running that poll, a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Thanks, Andy, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, just launched this poll. It should come up on your screen there now. Uh, so we have three questions. Um, the first question is, what sector are you in? Commercial production, organic production, pick your own or farm tourism uh, or other. Second question is, what is the most challenging? You can put a multiple choice in here. Um, establishment, weed control, disease and field rots, ripening and harvest, storage rots, other. So maybe pick the most important ones for you there. And the final question is, is this a crop you are thinking of growing more? Yes, no, or unsure. So I'll give you all a moment there just to fill in your answers. Okay. Another few seconds, you can see them all coming in here. Okay. Um, and now I'm sharing this, uh, the poll results up on your screen. Um, so the first question, what sector are you in? 53% um, in commercial production. It's uh, We've a, a few then, then interested in Pick Your Own or from Pick Your Own and Farm Tourism uh, and a few others. Um, the most challenging for the audience is weed control, which I think we're going to, we're, well, we're, we're definitely touching on tonight. Uh, disease and field rots, um, and then a bit of a mix then between the others. Um, 
is this a crop you're thinking of growing more? So definitely a lot of people on the on the call, 76% thinking of growing more pumpkins. So um, I'll stop sharing those results. And thanks, everybody, for your participation there. Um, I think we've we've plenty of interest in, by, from the audience here, Andy and Chris. Yeah, uh, great stuff. Uh, thanks for that, Owen. And thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for engaging with us there on that. Um, it might just give you, Chris, a bit of a, a bit of a steer on the way uh, our audience is thinking. And um, yeah, very interesting. Um, I, I would think in England and Wales, it's um, probably sixty-seven percent pick your own and twenty percent commercial. Unless you talk about acreage-wise, there's probably you know there's probably five, four or five growers growing up pretty much all the supermarket stuff. Very good. Okay. So look, uh, the way we're going to run this, Owen, you're going to you're going to control things there for Chris. So if you're going to if 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 you could share the screen, Chris, we'll we'll uh, give you the floor, and what we'll do is we'll 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 pop in and out to to make a few comments or ask you an odd question in the course of the your presentation. And I encourage people again, if they have any you know burning questions or comments, fire them into the question and answer box, and uh, we'll make sure that Chris gets to gets to to to, to answer those later on. So thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, no problem. We have the first slide. Right, pumpkins grown in markets in the crop. Um, well, it's a sort of relatively new crop, I suppose, that, um, you know, it started to, to get um, more public interest with the um, Halloween thing that came in from America, probably in the 90s. I first worked with a chap in North Wales who was doing pumpkin, he was doing largely courgettes for Liverpool market. And then, then he found that uh, they weren't asking for pumpkins and then the pumpkin orders went up and the courgette orders went down until he was growing all pumpkins and no courgettes. Yeah, I'm a horticultural advisor in ADAS, been about a bit. Um, I've worked on a fair few crops as well, but so uh, soft fruit and farm retail, I suppose, is my main thing now. Um, pumpkins is a big thing. We've got um, 35 farms just in Wales doing them now. So um, it's certainly in tourist areas. It's a very, very popular crop and people um, always surprise me in the efforts they do to market the crop. Um, the other thing that's really influenced pumpkins is social media. So um, the farms that's good at social media, Facebook and Instagram, whatever, they're the ones that tend to do well and they keep posting, they keep the posts up to date, they get plenty of likes, they sometimes even have internet influencers and um, it becomes um, a real talking point. And now it's a definite um, destination for um last week in September and three weeks in October. So it's a short marketing window. The weather doesn't seem too bad. So uh, we've had uh, mud in 2019 and it kept going okay. Um, as Andy said, one of my favorite crops is rhubarb. I like perennial crops. So I do rhubarb and asparagus along with the uh, fruit. And um, I think there's some, I think there's a lot of scope for growing rhubarb. Everyone knows what it is and it's always been featured in recipes. <laughs> And especially in Wales now, we're doing a heck of a lot of work on farm tourism. So um, all over Wales now, we've got um, loads of farms doing it, pretty much selling everything off the field. And um, it's, it's a really good boost for people just used to doing beef and sheep, etc. Gives them a bit of money to spend and uh, they get very, very enthusiastic about it. I just think that um, in 2020, we were on um, somewhere near maximum. So I wouldn't encourage people to plant big acreages now, but if they're good at promoting it then you know happy days right next slide please Aaron sorry it's just not moving on for me there for some reason there we go like Andy said uh, don't be afraid to put your hands up and um, ask any questions if if um, I don't see the uh, the uh, chat or the raised hands Andy or Owen just to remind me will you well, the picture there is what we want, a nice blue sky and loads and loads of ripe pumpkins. And that is a supermarket crop, big field. And those are actually grown through black polythene. So that's one way of doing it. Um, you can see there that um, they're very, very uniform. They're pretty much all of a size. That would be taken towards the end of September. And it was in the West Midlands. And um, you're probably talking um, 4,000 pumpkins to the acre, I would guess there. Um, supermarket supply, we've got um, a few farms doing sort of mega acreages. There's one chap in Lincolnshire who's between 700 and 1,000 acres. Um, 
there's a quite a few growers growing in excess of 100 acres. Uh, the supermarket supply is quite a difficult market because the price home to grower is quite low and there's a lot of um, um, tight specs on what you can actually give them. They don't want them too big because they're in, people put them in the boot and they can't get any shopping in. So they want a sort of football size and um, they some some supermarkets now are doing monsters. But um, in the field, it seems to be mostly monsters that people want. Um, if you're thinking about going into farm tourism, it's a very useful introduction because they, you know, they only cost about um, two, three thousand pound a hectare to grow. So um, if you're lucky with them, um, you know, you you can make a lot of money. If you're not lucky, then um, you don't lose a lot. So you're not investing in a lot of kit, etc. So I, I always think it's a lot easier than say going into pick your own fruit with tabletops and tunnels and all that entails and you're talking of spending 150 grand a hectare on that so there's a huge difference in some of these crops on the actual um setting up cost although fruit is probably a long-term better draw um but the pumpkins is a sort of instant hit the other thing about this crop is it's a summer crop so where we plant we sow and plant in may and they're out by the end of october so that makes them a lot less fussy on ground so they can go on some reasonably strong um, sandy clay loam I suppose would be getting heavy or a clay loam but uh, right the way down to sand and um, you don't tend to maul the ground about so they're useful for the ground. The other thing I always get asked is how many crops of pumpkins can you grow in a row. Um, if you grow more than one crop after another then that's bad horticulture but they don't seem to pick up much from the soil so um, I'm quite uh, happy for people to do two or three years, but ideally you would um, rotate, you know, one year in five, that would be perfection. Some farms rotate mm. a pumpkin field with a maize maize on tourist farms, and that works out really well. It's just swap them over every year, and um, it seems to suit both crops. Right. Uh, Chris, what, 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 no, I'm just a uh, point on the acreage for the supermarkets in the UK, Chris. Uh, what's been the trend for the last couple of years? Do you, is there, is the acreage continuing to increase or has it has it stabilised or what way is that going? I think the supermarket acreage is pretty stable, but um, a lot of farms don't like doing it because um, it's, it's mainly the logistics. And in 2020, we had a lot of problems with um, just there wasn't any lorries about in that October period and a lot of crops remained in the field and you know nobody seemed to be too worried the supermarkets were more keen on getting the, the basic food and pumpkins just got um, ignored so okay. that that always reflects back on the grower and um, like I say it's not a hugely expensive crop but if you've got 150 <laughs> acres on you know it, it, it adds up to a fair bit of money yeah so okay. the supermarket supply I would say is is steady and I think um, wholesale is well there's two sorts of wholesale there's wholesale into markets and then wholesale for more remote growers to supply into a pick your own farm so a lot of pick your own farms don't have the room but they've got a shop and a cafe and toilets and that and they will do a two acre token field and then top it up every night until the the end of the season so they get a few tame local growers and we we, we operate this top up system which is very very good so you can make a lot of money out of a two acre field um, if you've got some, some neighbouring farmers to grow them for you. Yeah, there's 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 one question here at the moment, um, Chris, and I guess you'll come on to it, but it's you can bear it in mind. What's the predominant growing method in the UK based on acreage? Is it direct sown or planting through black polythene? So I guess you'll you'll come on to that. We'll come on to that in a minute, but um, yeah, it's, it's food for thought. Um, there's no real easy answer to that one, but it's uh, horses for courses. But if we know the next one, Owen, Um, supermarkets tend to be uh, more focused on getting a sort of orange football sized pumpkin and um, it seems like the main thing for pick your own is also an orange pumpkin um, often the bigger the better so um, uh, orange is definitely the favorite the main seed houses and um, I'll put a list up a bit further on in the presentation but um, tozers um, those are the main ones, I suppose. Mole seeds and um, kings for the smaller growers. And um, there's some people like Sakata, et cetera, come in. But you, you're usually best to go somewhere near the breeder. So if you find out who's got a breeding program like Sakata or um, Clouser, 
um, you can get probably get new seed, better seed, and the seed with a bit more vigor. Uh -huh. Pick your own. You need a big range. So um, my current um, prescription is 35% um, monsters, 35% um, round orange, and the rest made up of whites, um, warts, small ones. And you need all that really. So on that picture there, you got some blue ones, which are the crown prints. You've got a few whites, a few uh, pumpkins and a few <clears> squash. <throat> Squashes are very useful because you can store them and people can eat them. So, um, you know, you can, you can keep them until this time of the year if you look after them. Supermarket spec. Um, the main problem you get with supermarket spec is that um, you need to get them clean. So um, they can be difficult to get off the field. And there's quite a lot of different methods employed. Um, probably your best bet is to harvest them as soon as they start going orange, maybe mid-September if you're lucky, and get them indoors. Once they're indoors, they've probably got 70-80% um, less chance of getting rot, and if you can get them indoors in somewhere warm, even less than that. Also, it just depends on the, the local market demand, so if you take them into your local market, um, you know, it depends on what they can sell, but they'll be mainly selling the first two weeks in October. Um, it's just a spec, really. You just have to make sure that everything's right in the um, in, in what um, size range you've got. Some of the big farms have a drone system and they can fly the drone over the field when they've windrowed them together and the drone will actually grade them into various circumferences and then the, the, the farm knows then how many they've got. If you can't get them indoors and um, you store them in the field until first week of October, then it's a bit of a white knuckle ride and you can get, you know, you can get a hell of a lot of rocks coming just on the standing um, crop. And that is very, very discouraging because they were, you know, they were beautiful in mid-September. So the message there is that if you can get them in and if you can keep them warm, so tunnels, um, any type of roof that's open to the atmosphere and let the wind blow through. What you don't want to do is put them in a cold store. If you put them in a cold store at two, you probably end up losing most of them, I would think. I've seen some very bad examples. Right, next one, please, Owen. Oh, and, uh, can, can I just fire one question at you there, Chris, while, while we're, well, you mentioned rotation earlier on, but there's, there's a question here about, have you ever seen inhibited germination or establishment on a second crop of pumpkins in the same field? I've never seen that, but um, it's difficult to um, say that, you know, it's not happened, but um, they don't seem to get a lot from the ground, but um, it's just bad horticulture. So the, the main problem really is weed, because if you, pumpkins are a weedy crop and you really want to be following a clean crop like cereal. So if you're doing a lot of pumpkins, if you're into the sort of 100 acre, you want to be following a really clean crop like sweet corn or um, cereals or something that's, you know, there's virtually no weed left in the land. Um, a, lot, a lot of it in Wales is plowing out pasture and, you know, that's just an absolute nightmare. So yeah. it's, um, it's more the preceding crop. Um, I've not seen germination affected, to be honest. So, yeah, the answer is, I, is I've not seen it, but I've not ever been made aware of it. Okay. This is me um, varieties, so uh, they change year on year. You just get used to a big variety and um, then it disappears for no reason. That All the seed, seed comes from the States. Um, there's a, the main seedsman there, so you can see which ones to get them from. Um, the easiest one to grow is definitely Harvest Moon. So if you grow Harvest Moon, it comes football size. It's almost ready in September and um, it's a good doer. So, um, you know, some farms... Even massive growers just grow more or less harvest moon. Racer and gladiator are two favourites on the supermarket farms, but the, you know there's plenty more. Um, if you carry, can you have the next one, please? You go into the mediums, then Gomez, and uh, that's a good one. A lot of people grow magician. Mars is very very popular. Moon is my favourite. And then if you pick your own answer supermarket, you do need some small ones that the kids can take. And then you need the, um, you know, the weird sort of warty ones to, just to get that Halloween flavor. There's the average measurement on that table. So if you use that table as a guide, you won't be far wrong. It's quite a useful document, really. I, I use that a lot in Wales and um, people can usually find one or two that's on that list in the catalogs. 
And would yeah. you say, is it Sakata is leading the charge on breeding, uh, Chris, or what seed house is more I engaged Tozer, in that? Tozer, yeah, Tozer are the leaders, but Tozer tend to want to just deal with big farms. So, um, you know, if you pick your owner, you have to get Tozer seed via uh, King's um, commercial. Um, I think um, Clouds have got a good breeding program, and I think Sakata are fairly new into it, but they, they're coming up with some really, really interesting selection. So, um, I think the best thing if you're doing tourism and maybe supermarket is, you know, if, it's, if there's room in your spec is to grow a good range of them and um, pick the one which suits your farm the best. But, you know, there's big changes year on year. So some varieties like um, Gladiator, they can be they can be bad in a bad summer. Race is usually pretty good. And Mars is usually pretty good. Moon is the best of them. Right, let's get on to production. The next one, please, Owen. Well, this is the big debate, really, um, planting or drilling. Um, neither of them particularly easy. Um, if you plant them, you've got to either raise the plants yourself or buy them in from a propagator. You'd be wanting about 112,500 plants per hectare or 1.25 to the meter. 5,000 to the acre, so it's slightly over one to the square yard. Modules take about three or four weeks from sowing, if you've got them in a tunnel or a glass house. And direct drilling is a, is a sort of easy option, but it's, it makes the weed control harder. And um, weed control in this crop, we'll come on to it a bit later, but it depends on stale. So if you do a stale and you're drilling it, you know, you need to be lucky. You need to have the sort of ground that won't go down like concrete. So if you've got the ground that will go down like concrete or even slump, if you get a bit of rain on it, um, look for doing modules. And those are the one, two, six modules on the right there. Yeah, they're um, easily grown by propagators and um, you can grow your own. You can get a huge amount in the smallest tunnel and um, you, then you've got a lot more control over them. You don't want to be planting them big, so um, a little bit, bigger than that picture but not much more you don't want them leggy so um if they get leggy then um if you get wind just after planting you get a lot of snapping off so that's a bit of a disaster direct drilling um typically with uh, modified maize vacuum drills um i think barfoot use a, pe a pico drills and um you know they, they're pretty accurate they, they got um gps and that now so they can actually drill them on the square but um my advice is to my growers always is if you if you're doing a lot of drilling, if you're drilling say 12 hectares of them, always spray your herbicide at the end of the day's drilling because if you don't and you get like a week of wind and rain, you can get weed coming up with the pumpkins and then you're dead. You can't do anything then. So you just we haven't got much in the way of herbicides. So um, you really just need to get that start on them. And if you can't get the herbicide on, then the direct drill is, is you know, getting to be really, really difficult. So if you get a, a direct drill field that's not had any herbicide, it's coming up with a complete lawn of weeds, then you're in a sort of nightmare, nightmare situation. There's no post-emergent control of weeds in this crop at all in England. I, I don't think you've even got anything at all in the Ireland, have you, Andy? Well, that's one of the big problems, Chris. Yeah, we, we, we have absolutely no approved herbicides pre or post emerge here. So like that, that you know, the direct drilling is, is one hell of a challenge. And if you don't, if the stale seeding um, isn't isn't up to 100%, then you're in trouble right from the start, you know? Yeah, that's exactly what we, I've been finding. But if, you, if you're planting out, then, um, you know, you've got more chance because you obviously can put out a plant that's got a, a three-week start, but they do take a bit of a check. So um, once the yeah. the drilled stuff is away, it does grow very, very quickly. Pumpkins do all their growing in July. So, you you know, if you, again, through social media, you learn about farming, and you learn how things go. And I had a client that um, posted the field from the same spot every month from... Um, May till um, August and the difference in um, the first of June, the, sorry, the last day of June to the last day of July was just incredible. It went from like a few plants yeah. dotted in the field to complete ground cover. And that is your window. You've got to get through till July. Um, so in dates, um, it's likely to be around 20th of May and nobody drew it on the 20th of May last year because it was diabolical then. It was frost every night. Um, 
we did draw some on the 20th of June. I did a variety trial with Owl Sons because they're just getting into pumpkins. And um, they got the seed, first of all, came with Thyram on it, which is now illegal. So we had to go back to the States and they got me some without Thyram. And I didn't actually direct drill them until the 20th of June. And they still made a good crop. But it was like, I don't know, it didn't seem to be a good summer, but it was a good pumpkin summer in 21. So, um, you know, everybody had a good crop. There was very few rots. And, um, you know, you, you think, right, it must have been a brilliant summer, but it wasn't. But they did really well. Right. Um, right there's, building up, yeah, we? there's a couple. And we might just take them while, you, while you're on the yeah, business of direct everybody. drilling. Like what date for direct drilling? There's a, a direct question here. And I suppose I have one that I'd like to throw out. We're I'm down here in the south and the southwest where it's 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 a lot wetter and it's not as warm and sunny as it might be in the southeast and up in the eastern region here, Chris, a bit like your own. Um, but like, would that that twentieth of May? I mean, would it be an order for fellas down in the southwest to go earlier, south and southwest go earlier because of our duller conditions, wetter conditions? Or is uh, we have less frost, of course. Yeah. Um, well, or, the answer to that, Andy, is if it was ideal on the um, between the twenty first and the end of April, you drill them then. I mean, I've got people down Gower and Pembroke, and they drill pre pre May. But okay. the problem with that is that um, if you get a good summer, they they become ready very very early, and then you've got the problem of field storage. So you know, it's always. But if you, it's like any other crop, if you get a window, you best get them in the ground and then dealing with the other problems after. Yeah. Because yeah. it might be, you know, 20, the, 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 the sort of 20, 20th to, when I say the 20th of May, that's, that's a guide to me, but I would say that's anything from the, the 5th of May to the end of May. Okay. Okay. So but you want to try and get them drilled on good conditions just before rain. And then the, the pumpkin's a big seed and it's got plenty of seed energy or seed vigor. But if you drill them into dust, then you, you know, you, 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 um, you're in a very, very difficult situation because they'll germinate and they won't have the, the, the oomph to come through the ground. You, you, you mentioned there earlier about uh, ground conditions and slumping and that, Chris. Um, few people de-stone here before they, they, they plant or even drill. What, what do you think of de-stoning? Is it necessary? Yeah, it's, it's always going to help. It's going to make the drilling more accurate for a start. And it's going to make, it's much more likely that the seed will be in contact with plenty of soil. So yeah, I'd go for that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be a good technique. I mean, it's a lot, of, it's a lot more work, but you know, if you've got the kit, uh, then I'd certainly be looking at that. Yeah, I think it will give you much more uh, predictable results. Because if you um, are doing supermarket crop, the nearer to the target density you get, the more of your target size you'll get. So if they come up gappy, you'll get loads of sort of rank growth, big ones, and you get the dreaded double set. So you get like another load set in um, late August, and then right. they'll still be green in uh, October. And that that itself can be a nightmare to a supermarket farm. Not so bad for the pickier owners. And because they, you know, they sell green most years, and unless they're all orange, like last year, and then, you know, everybody has an orange one, but, um, you know, they're not the punters aren't too bothered about green okay so chris and yeah so I'll plant from the so I'll plant from the 20th of april to the 20th of june depending on where you were and how high up you were and if the more marginal you are the better you probably are going with plants not seeds so anybody in wales who's high up above 400 feet i say you know always use plants mm -hmm. I don't know if you've got that there, but I wouldn't be surprised if you've got some grows on, on you know, pretty marginal ground, pretty marginal. Uh, we do. Equipment yeah. and, you know, margin, margin, margin. They, they're best with plants. So given, given the vagaries I mentioned about direct drilling that we have zero herbicides, I mean, your guy is doing the, the bigger acreage, we'll say, in the east of England. Um, like, is, is there... They'll do a bit of both, will they? Is it what sort of breakdown? Is it a third planting, two well, thirds drilling, or what way does it go? I think on the big farms it's all drilled. Um, but um, I have been talking to some big farmers, and then they say, "Well, the drill's all right, but um, you know, we were to get this target density, we're probably better using plants." And then they start talking about doing doing them through polythene, so they don't have all this hassle with weeds. Yeah. The, the problem okay. with the with the farm these days is they got no spare labour, so. 
if you get a farm that, a field that goes under you just haven't got the people to put in it so you you, you can't really let that happen yeah so then you uh, you know drill without herbicides it'd be very very difficult I'm, you know i'm surprised you, you you must have nerves of steel to do that yeah uh, yeah chris before you move on there one one other one you you mentioned the plant density there is there any particular layout in terms of you know rows per bed or spacing to give you that kind of optimum density and you know in turn the the the, the importance of you know having evenness in the crop to give you the yeah, well, spot on it's, specification it, well it's like any veg or whatever if you get that 1.25 to the meter you won't be far wrong but it's it's probably about one meter by 0.9 or 0.85 okay. or something, but it doesn't matter which way around you. I mean, you know, within a fairly wide band, they'll, you know, if you, I mean, I've got Christmas tree growers doing, and they've only got a tackle based on 1.4. Right. They put them really close down row, but they still get the same pumpkins because they got the same ground. Yeah. So you can go from one point, you know, from one meter between the rows to um, 1.4. Like I say, a lot of the farms drill on the square and they drill at about 0.95. And is there any is there any difference then between you mentioned the large ones, the medium ones, the small, the minis, the gourds, the likes of those? Are they all basically the same density planting? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, with the smalls, you often get three or four on a plant. That's the difference. Um, right. And the mediums, you might get two, but the monsters, you tend to only get one. Okay. Um, we did some trials on pumpkins um, in Wales. EIP trial on putting calcium feeds on and they were obsessed with the uh, the yield in tons per hectare but I mean nobody ever looks at yields of pumpkins in tons per hectare so it's it's numbers per hectare we're after yeah, yeah. so I, I wouldn't have a clue what the yield is in tons per hectare but it'd be pretty high I bet uh, one other one Chris here before you move on if you don't mind what seed sowing depth would you recommend well I will say drill into moisture but I mean it's easy to say that isn't it don't okay. don't i've got a phobia about drilling in dust and it really upsets me when i see it especially if people haven't got water so you know i mean nobody's got water if you're doing big acreages on because you just you just can't put that resource in yeah yeah so um put them into some moisture and then you so the thing is is they're they're sort of tropical and it is may when you sow them so that you know if they're happy they'll come up in two weeks okay right can I have the next one Owen. Yeah, well, this is another moot point. Um, I work with a lot of veg farms. The supermarket farms that grow pumpkins are all veg men, pretty much. And they they like nitrogen and they like water. So um, I often get to the situation when a grower will send to me, they looked a bit poor, Chris, so we put 100 keys of nitrogen on and give them an inch of water. Well, I mean, that's what you don't want to do, really, because they, they get very, very vegetative and they just tend to grow massive, great big leaves, a bit like rhubarb. And um, they won't set female flowers early, but we'll come on to that in a bit. But um, keep the low end. RB209, you've got to be careful because the, 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 I don't know if you use 209, do you much, Andy? Well, we look, it's it's a basis. We have something very similar. We call it the green book here, Chris. The green book. Um, well, yeah, it's but your the, green the, book the same as our 209. It's, it's similar. <laughs> And pumpkins and courgettes um, come under the same banner. And obviously courgettes are a much more vegetative crop because you harvest them every two or three days. Pumpkins, you don't. If you put the nitrogen rates on 209 on, you'll, you'll get them up around your ears and, and very, very late to flower. So my rule of thumb, if you haven't got any analysis, which is crazy really these days, the price of fertilizer, go with uh, 10, 10, 20, high K. And if your P is high above index three, use something like K nitro. But don't get panicky and put um, a top dressing on or an inch of water unless you have to. So it's um, a crop that's better grown a bit lean and mean, really. You get some good pumpkin fields and they've virtually got no leaf in them. Those are the ones you want because then the sun gets on the fruit. But if you've got one that's like, you know, you can walk into them and they're up to your waist, then that's what you don't want. So that's it. The, the, the message there is P and K index three. Um, I'd go um, low N 
or nil in the base. And then if they weren't grown, I might put a bit on as a top dressing, but that would be very, very rare. Right, next one, please, Owen. Well, you know, it's easier to drill a big area than it is to um, plant it. That's a pretty sophisticated rig at Barfoot. They're drilling direct into black plastic. I think the machine's laying the plastic as well. Goes on about 90 mile an hour. It's a fair bit of kit that is, but um, yeah, it works really well and um, it punctures the hole and plants the seed through it. Um, uh, getting back to herbicides, on that system, it's the only system where I would use wing P. We've got wing P as an emu for a directed spray, but we've had some right disasters with it. So I don't tend to recommend it even as directed unless there's some polythene. Pumpkin's got a, a bad, you know, bad result with um, any any stomp in any form. So there's stomp in wing P and they just don't like it. So that's where you're using wing P pre-emerge or pre, uh, pre laying the yeah. plastic and direct drilling? Um, bare ground on that path as it is there. So okay. you have that You'd have that bit. You'd have that being followed by a machine putting wing P on that path. All oh, right, right, okay. Again, in um, that system, if you if you leave it a day or two and you get rain and wind on it, and the weed comes up in that path, then that's almost as bad as having no polythene. But you were saying there's an issue with wing P getting down into those those little holes where the 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 seed are going to emerge. Yeah, it's funny because we did trials on it, and you know we we put it overall and we put it on. Um, we, this was the. Um, Scepter 2 trials for HDB and we put it on overall and um, just down the pathways and some years it was all right and some years it just wiped them out so I mean after that suddenly they came up with an emu for it which shocked us a bit but um, you know that they said farmers wanted it so they went for it but it, it scared us and we always you know we started putting in our literature that it was too risky. And is that the four litre per hectare rate Chris? Um, yeah yeah it's four litres yeah Right. Brassic rate. Yeah, that's the full rate, yeah. That's the full Monty, yeah. Um, I think weed control can be easier with plants. Um, we've got, in this in, in England, we, in Wales, we've got uh, Gamut, which is a really good herbicide. We've got Flexidor, which is, you know, lasts about a fortnight and costs a fortune. And we've got Curve. And um, all of them can go over the top of the plants, but um, Gamut can be a bit lively. So what we tend to do is... Um, we go a roundup gamut stale, which is about more than five days before drilling or planting, and then come over the top with um, flexidor and curve. That's all we've got. Okay. And that can give you that can give you a good fortnight on drill down on um, plants. Okay, so that yeah, so that that'd be your recommendation with the chemistry you have. I chemistry mean, we've got gamut gamut. Full rate gamut, 0.25, yeah. plus round it, you know, if you've got perennial weed, five litres, if you've got no perennial weed, two, and then um, follow up with um, curve, you can go a bit higher with the curve on heavier ground, um, it's usually around about 1.1, and the Flexidor 500 mil, and, um, and then, you, you know, you want a bit of luck, really, with this crop, so, um, you know, we come on to it a bit later on, but be prepared to do some weeding. It's not yeah. like sweet corn and carrots and that, you know. But, but I think, Chris, w w you know, the, the 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 people here, if there is, you know, like I say, we have absolutely the zero approved currently. I think we yeah. have we have gamut on courgettes uh, under off label. That's the only thing on that on courgettes. But like, you know, if 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 there's going to be a move towards a bit more direct drilling, and it is going to, it looks like people are going to want to do more of. Uh, pumpkins gone forward then they may come together and, and look for maybe one or two of these off labels that you mention um, is there anything else coming out of trials or from the work that you are doing yeah well <clears throat> you know a lot of these growers are pretty savvy these days and they're online looking at what they use in the states and in the states they use mostly emerger which is the sort of linear on replacement so emerger is safe on pumpkins but um we've been trying to get an emu for it for a couple of years and it's not come but um right you know, it's, it's a it's a good herbicide a clonifen so um you know that hopefully that will come soon but um emerger is it's a lot better than what we've got but it's not 100 percent yeah okay
So on carrots and you know all the other crops where emerging works really well, it's usually used with stomp, but stomp is a big no-no on the cucurbit crop. So back to water only needed to establish. So if you have got irrigation, you can put it on just after you drill or just after you plant. If you haven't got a, an irrigation system, you can do vacky tankers or even blokes with lances, but you can't just let the seed come up if it's dry. So okay. you put on, put on water for establishment and that's all you should need, even on okay. sand. Point right, well made. Time. Yeah. Well, this is my recipe. So this is a, this is an interesting slide. This is because uh, this is our this is our trial site for an AHDB herbicide trial, and um, it had the usual uh, gamut curb flexidor. Uh, didn't have any wing P, but it did go. They did go through it with um, Gozai, and um, which was illegal at the time. They also went through with Shark. And that was the um, the picture at the top was the the crop in um, early June because they were drilled early, and the bottom picture is the same crop at the end of July. So what happened was it got buried in fat end, which is quite common occurrence. And um, if you ever getting if you ever get buried in fat end like that, don't let it get that big. So you can you can easily hoe it in ten minutes as a seedling. That then it that picture then is an absolute nightmare because that will swamp that crop it will get to a meter and a half tall grows as big as a tree and um, it will stop the light getting on the pumpkin so they never turn orange and they get full of rot so you know all you can do then is put a gang of blokes to go through and I, I wouldn't pull because they come up with a massive root plate so I just go through with some loppers and lop it off and that's way quick way quicker than pulling it I've seen some horror stories but that that field at the top was perfection. It was drilled on a square and it was um, crossed with um, contact herbicide. And then it went on to late on. And I've seen that a million times. So you'd, you'd suggest going in with a loppers, Chris, and lopping that at the base rather than pulling them? Yeah. Uh, but I, what I would really advise is um, get them at the cotyledon stage. But we get agronomists who say, oh, well, next time it rains, it will reactivate the herbicide. And you think, well, it won't. And it never does. And then by right. the time you've, you've made that bad decision, you're fat end. Somehow fat end can grow to a metre tall, like in the desert. Yeah, so it's, we know. I don't know if you, if you call it fat end over there or muckweed or whatever, but it's a horrible we, we, we call them We call them small ash trees over here, Chris. Small ash trees, yeah. Well, yeah. You, you know, you won't get the colour in that, but it's um, a bad... <laughs> Bad, bad weed, yes. It doesn't, so, it doesn't, it doesn't attack. Uh, that so if you, you, know, you, you can't hoe that field. So, uh, you know, hand no. hoeing is a minimum 200 pound an acre cost, you know, 500 pound a hectare. So you're talking big numbers then. Yeah. And if you're on a supermarket farm, if you're getting 40p a pumpkin home to grow, you haven't got big cost centers to take off that. No. Yeah. So that's the stir. That's what you could do with. But if you could add a merger to that list of a rigid to to that residual list, that would be much better. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it likely to? Are they hopeful in the UK that the merger will come on stream? Well, we were very, very hopeful until um, the AHDB got voted out, and then no, nobody knows what's happening. Okay. You could argue it's our own fault. We did okay. um, three years of herbicide trials on pumpkins and out of all the materials we had, the two best treatments were emerger and the second best treatment was stale seed bed. Okay, so it's right, okay. And that was three years, so um, that's pretty reliable. So the stale is a must, I'm afraid. So if you've got slumpy sort of silty ground, um, good luck, but um, you know, stale is a big part of it. Right. And what about you, you? Some of these things like uh, finels, and we have we have um, similar here in it's one of these paragonic acid products, Caton Gold. It's quite expensive. Um, it's expensive, and you need a huge dose of it. But yeah, it works all right. But all these things work best on small weeds. Yeah. That's, what you got to do? What you got to do? Anybody who's listening here is you haven't got to get in the state of that bottom picture and it's right saying you know you can't help it that that field and the one next to it made 40 acres so they had 40 acres like that to play with you wouldn't yeah. want it i tell you you wouldn't be growing them after that that's for sure well you know it, it's just making a mockery of the old crop there's not that much money in it you get a disaster like that and then it's more or less a write-off so 
you know, it's a shame because the top picture was so promising. They're a bit, yeah. see, they're a bit vegetative there. I don't, you know, I don't like to see them that tall without pumpkins on. Yeah. You don't know what treatment that was, do you, Chris? Yeah, that was the, that was gamut curves, actually, do All right. Okay. That was the first treatment, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was drilled. Right. So don't expect too much. It won't stop your late fat in. And is that like what other weeds were were issues on that soil uh, that you did the trials on? Well, when, when we started, obviously we had a untreated control. I mean, it was like a botanical garden, so there was everything under the sun in it. There was grass and there was ground soil. There was um, all the brassica weeds like runch and um, shepherd's purse. There was it was a wide, wide you know, good wide range of weeds. It was a brilliant trial from that point of view. Right, right. But sometimes we do trials on big farms, especially carrots and that, and they've had so long in seals, you, you don't even get any weed in the trial on the untreated. I think that's an important point, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the grounds you go on, you should look, the cropping history is important. I mean, we're we're obsessed here with going on, you know, maybe lay ground for some crops or following lay, and, uh, you know, it's it's you're, you're walking into trouble from the start. So, like, as you say, maybe follow it. You're suggesting cereal or maize might be a better a better plan of action for something like yeah, the, I think the, it's, this family. It's something that you're good at with weed control. You want you know you don't want a big weed burden in the ground and um, yeah you know, that fat end, that fat end in that bottom picture, believe it or not, is low density. But they like you say they were like ash trees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, final sun. Yeah, it's all right, but it works better on small weeds, and sometimes it doesn't work. So you know, it's funny stuff. Yeah, we right, have, we video. have, um, yeah, the last point you made, we, we have uh, shark, people might know shark, uh, we, we have that here in the farm of, it's Spotlight Plus, so people are getting familiar with that as a, as a, a relatively new desiccant, which is, you know, taken over from the likes of, of um, Reglon in, in recent years. Yeah. It's good um, stuff, but it doesn't take um, um, a lot of weeds, it doesn't take ground soil. It doesn't yeah. take cheap weed and it doesn't touch grass. So doesn't, yeah. yeah. They're not the end of the world, those weeds, but they're bad enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's a bit of a I think uh, Owen is going to put up a small clip from um one of the um there's an Italian company, Spapira, they're they're um they do a range of machinery. Chris, you're familiar with this and uh, they've they've um there's a little clip of of um a uh, single row uh, hydraulic, I think, driven uh, where they're, they're, um, it takes old weeds. It's, um, they're, they're a newer range of machinery that, 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 that seem to be available now for, for this kind of, this kind of operation. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, uh, Chris. I'll just share this video now. Um, it should be on your screens. And just, I'll remind everybody as well, while, um, that the, the link for the IASIS points is, is in the chat as well for anyone who wants to get it. Thanks for that, Owen. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I say, that's that's um, an Italian machine. There are agents in the UK, uh, JF Hudson, and um, that kind of gear. I think the single, the single row uh, hydraulic is around the six thousand, seven thousand pounds mark, 
but uh, there's a bigger machine that's when well, they're in two, three, and four row, from what I understand. And the the bigger machine can be upwards in the region of of obviously tar- bigger money, thirty thousand. But Chris, you're familiar with that that equipment or that that machinery? Yeah, one of my clients had one on demo last year, and um, he liked it, and it worked really well on his crops. He grows about seven acres to pick your own pumpkins, and um, it got him out of a lot of trouble. And it was um, yeah. It was way, way quicker than uh, hoeing, and it did a good, as good a job. So, yeah, he was really pleased, and he bought the demo model and, um, you know, got it in the shed ready for next year. And now he's – what it does is it stops him getting sleepless nights, so, we, you know, we're not going to get a crop that goes under, like, that supermarket picture. And yeah. I think if you – you know, especially pick your own, you can make really good money out of pumpkins. If you can get 3,000 pumpkins off a field and you're getting a five reach for them, you know, it's a, it's a lot of money for a gross output. And then you, it pays you to reinvest in some decent kit. If you, you know, you'd, you'd be mad not to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, look, before before we move on to maybe the, the last couple of things like diseases and that, um, and we'll take the questions as they come in. Uh, there's one here on would carb applied in June give poor results or be of short duration in a dry summer if we were allowed to use it, Chris? Yeah, well... Um... You know, herbicide, residual herbicides never last long if they last at all in dry soil. No. So it's, um, you know, you, you don't get a choice really. If you if you drill in dust and put your herbicide on dust, then the seed won't come up, but the weeds will. So yeah. know, it's a bad lesson, but that's really what happens. So yeah, yeah you've, got to have, you've got to have irrigation or water to get the, the, the residuals to work. And, um, you know, this is the whole point about needing water for establishment that herbicide is part of it you know it gets, yeah. the, it gets the roots away quickly and um, stops the weed coming because the, the residual seals the ground and one other one chris any growers using straw mulch between rows for weed control i've never seen straw mulch but there's one or two growers looking at um crimping um clover and cereal and that sort of thing so i'm a bit a bit new on that technology but that some farms do especially the organic people they're talking about um going through with um a sort of rib roll crimping the thing and then drilling through that and um okay. obviously you know clover is not fat and it might sort of take hold but it's not going to get over the top of the crop and you know often in pick your own there is a message if you've got like um you know, you can say, well, we don't use any chemicals. We're using this clover as, a, as an understory. But, you know, to me, clover is a weed, so I'm a bit, um, a bit careful of it, really. Yeah, and the, there's the, the nitrogen element as well, of course. It fixes Well, there is, it? yeah. So, yeah. you know, you, if they got into that nitrogen, you, you might never see them again. Mm. Okay. Just another one, um, Chris, there. There's, there's growers using, um, using bees for pollination. Is there any value in that, do you think? Yeah, I've heard of people doing it, but um, I don't think there's much value. But, you know, it depends on your situation. Um, there's a lot of, you know, they flower mainly in July. And there's a lot of flies and bumblebees and that about now. So I, I, I see millions and millions of bees in them. You know, it's not, you know they, they seem to have plenty there. But um, it's always interesting. Um, again, it's if you're doing um, Facebook, etc., it's something else to post up. You know, all, you know, all the bees, you know, I've got 10,000 workers in this crop for you and all that sort of malarkey, you know. But actually, is um, a way of getting things pollinated. I don't think it's got much in the way of legs. Yeah. Okay, I'll share the, the rest of this, uh, yeah. Chris's presentation. Okay, I'm just opening this door because I'm not like bugs in the pot. No problem. Could, could I just say um, for anyone, look, thanks for those that are engaging there and sending in your questions. We're, we're delighted to, to see such interest. And um, so, look, yeah, any questions or comments, just bang them in the, in the Q&A and we'll make sure that, that uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll get them to Chris before he finishes. Right. Diseases. Um, well, we have a fear of powdery mildew, but um, towards the end of the season, pow- powdery mildew can be your friend because it takes a lot of foliage off. So normally I advise um, weed control until about mid-August, um, judging by the crop. But if, as soon as you get anything orange in the field, then don't worry about mildew at all. Some farms think that um, the powdery mildew 
um, gets in the pumpkins and makes them rot, but it doesn't. So, um, yeah, that's, there's about 50 things that do rot pumpkins, fusarium being the main one, and apparently fusarium is in nearly every field. But um, powdery mildew isn't. So powdery mildew will give you a lot of leaf damage, but that can be quite useful in a very vegetative crop. Often grows put on a wide spectrum fungicide. I think Andy said you've got Amistar top. So that's um, Strobilurin and Aconazole. So, you know, that's pretty hefty mixtures. That will control most things. Um, field rots, um, you do get them. Um, it's mainly to do with rain reef. If you don't get rain, they're pretty hardy. If they do get rain, then they can get a lot of rots in them. Um, on my soft fruit um, hat on, we know that um, botrytis gets into the, the crop and probably other funguses do down through the pollen tube. So then we, you know, we know that we've got to spray two or three times during flowering to keep botrytis out of the crop. Um, that seems logical to apply that to pumpkins, but I don't have any proof. So, um, you know, it's, I think if you put on a something like, well, we use Signum, but you, you guys use an Amistar top, that, you know, do that in July before they start to trail, because after they start to trail, you do a lot of damage driving through and um, it can give you peace of mind. We also have been doing trials on calcium foliar feeds. Um, foliar feeds, in my opinion, aren't particularly brilliant because plants are designed to take in feed through the roots, but calcium can be a problem when there's poor transpiration. So if you've got a poor root system, you could well find a calcium foliar feed does some good. Storage rots is another nightmare. So um, this is where we don't want them stored in the cold. We don't want them washed because the wash sort of basically um, washes them in a fusarium soup and you can, you know, so one crop, they, they, they wash them all because they got them ready in August put them in a cold store at two degrees and the old lot came out under the door in the end. So that was a salutary lesson. It was a, a huge amount of pumpkins as well. So don't store them cold, don't wash them. You might be able to just wipe off the bit of soil that sticks on them if you have to harvest them when it's a bit moist. But if you can get them out the field and get a roof on them, your storage rots will be negligible. If you, if you get them ready in August and you try and get them in the supermarket stillages off the field in October, you can end up with 50% rots, like 2019. The one in the picture there, Chris, what's that? That's blossom end rot, the bottom one. So um, blossom end rot um, is probably, um, well, not probably, but will be helped by um, sprays of calcium. Calcium, okay. Yeah, so that, that's what we were looking at, really. We just really... Um, extrapolated from courgettes because courgettes get a lot of uh, blossom and rot and they do treat courgettes with calcium so it seemed logical to do it in pumpkins but it's not a thing you see a huge amount of but um, in a season when you didn't get much transpiration sort of dull foggy weather then then that could well be an issue because calcium uptake is to do with transpiration okay what's the best timing um chris uh, for the calcium Calcium applications, folio calcium. So, applications. Yeah, it's, it's good. Good question. I, I mean, it's all to do with fruit swelling, really. So um, as soon as you can get a spray on straight after they start to set, or even when you get female flowers, that would be the time, and maybe go every uh, fourteen days. Okay, so that would be the answer there. And you mentioned signum, Chris. We we have signum on courgettes, but again, we we like I say, we are so limited on the pumpkin uh, crop. Like that, yeah, well, growers are using. Yeah, we've got a big range of um, mildew sides on pumpkins. Uh, I mean, you can always use bicarb and just keep doing it. But um, you know, okay. bicarb five gram a litre is a good uh, mildew. It, it'll clean up what mildew is there on the day. Okay. But um, yeah, we've got things like. Um, um, well, I've got my list in front of me now, but there's there's a fair old list of um, mildew sides. Okay. But um, the, the wide spectrum ones are the best. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Tally is what we use a fair bit of. But yeah. yeah, we got yeah, we, we got a range, you know, but I don't like to I don't like to think that you've got to control mildew all the way through August. I don't think it, you know, I don't think it's necessary. But you would you would advocate doing something before in the run up to the July if 
particularly if it's dry. I mean, I get the impression like in courgettes, we don't worry too much about it. But you're saying it's something that there there should be something done if there is, we, like I say, we have a couple of things, but you should do something. Uh, in, yeah, in, I think in, if, you had a, if you had a hot, dry sort of mid-July, then you could be in trouble with mildew and it could, you could defoliate the crop too early. Right. So that's what, you know, a lot of this spraying, same in soft roof, it, it's done to give you peace of mind. And anything that gives you peace of mind as a grower or farmer in my book, you know, it's well worth putting on. But, you know, it's, um, you can't predict the weather, so we put it on for peace of mind. Yeah. Okay. Next one, please, Aaron. Okay. Well, there's your, your female and male flowers. So um, often you get, uh, especially in a vegetative crop, you get loads and loads of males and um, pollinated by bees and other insects. So they do need insect pollination. Um, if you get the crop too vegetative, the females are delayed. And, you know, the last thing you want in pumpkins is any sort of delay. Hives are rare and the crop largely sets in July. You can see the difference between the flowers. The female's got a little ovary on the bottom and the male hasn't. Believe it or not, on some pick your own farms that also do fruit, we get people in the pumpkins harvesting the flowers to serve as sort of stuffed flowers. So, you know, you, you come across everything. And, um, you know, they're big flowers and they're very, very attractive to the uh, pollinating insects. And, you know, I've seen three or four bumblebees in every flower in big fields. So I'm not worried about it, but, you know, sometimes the way we're moving in agriculture now with beetle banks and, you know, banks of um, wildflowers and weeds and that, then, you know, we tend to get a lot more pollinating insects. So, you know, I, I don't think it's a big problem. I would see it as being a big thing on, on your Facebook and your Instagram that, you know, they've got these bees working away for you. And, you know, the bees are working really hard to give you a crop in October, sort of, you know, as a Facebook post in July. There is a question here, Chris, just on that very subject about would there be any value in using pollinator mixes on headlands to bring bees into the fields? Yeah, I go for that. I think certainly pick your own, anything like that really sets the field off. So we often have growers that break up the varieties with rows of sunflowers and stuff, and then those fields look great. But, um, you know, sunflowers are really good at attracting bees and flies. So, yeah, I'm happy with that. And um, I think, it, you know, it, it's good for... Um, it's good for the public perception of farming, I think. You know, I think if, if people see fields of flowers and not sort of sterile fields of corn without any weeds in, then, um, you know, they're a lot happier. Okay. Uh, be before you move on, I suppose, Chris, um, there's just another, going back to the storage rots or the field rots, there's a question here about a, where a grower is getting a rot that starts like a cigar burden that develops. Is there any... Is there any diagnosis for for what that is and what stops it? A cigar like I've got, a cigar burden I've got a paper, uh, symptom. I've got a paper on um, diseases from the states I could share with you, Andy. And you could have a look through that. I think there's about fifty on it, man. It's a bit of a scary <laughs> read. <laughs> you can keep that one, Chris. We have enough to be getting on with. <laughs> yeah, it's a scary read, but um, yeah, there's a, in the see in the states they've been growing pumpkins for years and years and years, and they know all the diseases, and um, you know they. In the states where we got the storage information from, they, they try and get them off the field and into, well, they say um, 80 Fahrenheit, but they mean about 30 odd centigrade. So, you know, if you can get them in at 30 um, centigrade, they won't only keep till October, they'll keep till now. They'll keep till <laughs> April. They'll go to, they'll go, yeah. <laughs> get the skin, you know, get the skin ripe like wood and they, they just never, you yeah. know, you can just, they just they never rot. Yeah. Yeah, so that, you know, that's the message really. Yeah, well, look, well, yeah, I couldn't say that disease, but um, I've got a picture. I've got a horrible leaflet with hundreds of coloured pictures. Well, look, if there is any, I mean, that grower, if, if he's interested in sending in a sample to, to, to ourselves, either myself or Owen, like we have, we have our own lab where we can, we can, um, or the pathologist can have a look at it and we can try and diagnose it and maybe we can pin it down. So feel free yeah. to, to make contact and, 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 and send in a sample. Um, that's what we're all about. Well, it's a good point. I mean, us, us as frontline advisors in ADAS and with, with uh, TGAS, we are backed up with plant pathologists and um, entomologists, and they know they know what makes these things tick. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a lot happier if I'm in a field and I see a rot, 
and I can send a WhatsApp picture to a plant pathologist and they, they not only know about the disease, but they know how it spreads and what likelihood there is to be an epidemic. So, you know, don't be afraid to use scientists, you know, you get the proper opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris, um, I'm just uh, reminding everyone we're 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 keeping people well over. Um, they'll be they'll be getting hungry for pancakes um, at this stage, yeah. I'm sure, given the night that's in it. But look, it's it's it's. Um, I think it's worthwhile. It's it's gone on for about ten past eight, but we have we have another ten or fifteen minutes if that's all right with you. So look, we'll run through the slides, and if there yeah, is the any, quick, yeah, yeah, we'll 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 uh, we'll start uh, to tidy things up. Yeah. Right, if you just run through them, Owen, we can, um, yep. well, this is the pricing for Pick Your Own, so, you know, you can refer back to that later on, but um, we're yep. getting a tenner for a big pumpkin, and then if you've got 4,000 of them to the acre, then, you you know, happy days. Um, they all, they're all dealt with in wheelbarrows, and the bigger the wheelbarrow, the better, because you can get more pumpkins in. People often go away with 40 quids worth of pumpkins in one car, so that's the message from Pick Your Own. All right. Next one. Well, this is the storage, really. And they asked me to put a storage slide in. So we've, I think we've covered all that. Yeah. 25 degrees plus is ideal. Field storage, a lot of rots. Um, some farms go through and cut the vines. I'm not convinced about it. It's a big job. Some some people do a hammer cut, so they cut the stem both sides. But um, I'm not convinced. I've seen them, um, you know, not. and sometimes the punters like to take the, 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 the vine with them. Just so, briefly, um, uh, sorry, sorry, Chris, go on. Well, I was just saying that um, cutting the vines is, you know, you've got to go through the whole field, cut every one with loppers, and some do two cuts per vine. So it's a big job, but I don't really see a lot of benefit in it. But the farms that do it sort of swear by it. Yeah. So just a, a, a quick question, uh, Chris, just on storage. Some growers have to um, have to wash for, for their market. How long would you say you could store if you had to? Um you know, thinking just of the week coming up to Halloween before fusarium is a real risk. Well, if I had um, if I had storage, I'd store them dry and dirty and wash them before I put them in the supermarket stillage. Okay, yeah. I think they only last days if they uh, if you get them in that fusarium. I think it's you know you you, you take a big risk with it. Yeah. Okay. So I would wash them. You know, I would wash them bone dry. I think they got it. If they set a good skin, then that skin. Is very very resistant to rot, but um, off the field, I wouldn't fancy it. And how 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 soon would you know if they are getting close to being ripe? I know the colour is is one thing to watch, Chris, and you alluded to that. But like you know, the skin thickening and hardening, and do they get a bit hollow sounding, or what are the other yeah. sort of? It's one of, the, one of the tricks I often do when I walk through a field, I'm sort of tapping them. And if you hear like a hollow sound, then it's a lot better than hearing like a dull thud. So, yeah, a hollow sound is very, very encouraging. Okay. Yeah. And should you cut them Cut them when they're, at what stage should you cut them? Should you cut them when they're ripe? Yeah, ideally you cut them ripe and get them off the field. But some farms cut them early to aid the ripening. I'm, I'm not convinced of that one. Okay. Yeah. Next one, please, Owen. Just that this is, you know, what you can make a lot of money on with pumpkin pick your own. We get cafes. Cafes will take a third of the takings with cakes and coffees and stuff. You can have carving schools and various things. You can have trailer rides. You can build up good infrastructure like having hard car parks and that. So you win if it's um, a wet season. So this is just for the pick your owners, really. But um, infrastructure is um, quite a big thing with pumpkins because you know you are getting them off at a time of year when you're quite vulnerable to wet and then um, like i said they don't like wet and mud if you want to try and keep the rots out of them but um, a lot of people making a lot of money on pumpkins by adding value to them you know and doing your cafes and that thing's only a shipping container and it, it took 60 grand one year Chris, you know, people that are on the, in the pick your own business are, you know, f specifically for the, that, that Halloween uh, event um, with pumpkins that are in the field and they are kind of ripening up around September. Would it be a good thing to, to, to lift them and put a bit of straw under them to, to keep them from getting 
uh, rotting or uh, you know ma- making conditions sort of reasonably good for for foot travel later yeah, on. I, well, to be honest, Andy, I often get asked that, and um, you know, my answer is really that it'd be a hell of a job. But um, I would think it's a bit like strawberries, you know, growing the old-fashioned way. They were they were a lot better looking when they had straw on them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, there wouldn't be much technical advantage, but it would make the field look great. Yeah. Okay. I mean, some some farms, you know, they, they have the pumpkin field a long way away, and they um they put all the pumpkins out in a yard, and they have various attractions like straw bales, and that, and just stack them on the bales. They don't you don't have to go to the field, but some people like to go there for their WhatsApp photos and that. And the experience. This is yeah. just um, card payments. I, I think if you've got a good group in in Southern Ireland. You want to get a WhatsApp group going between you because they all my Welsh growers they sorted all this card payments and paying with phones and all that in the field on their own. You know, it was nothing to do with me because I don't know anything about it. On the Tubby Cymru Knowledge Hub, we have got you know a lot about um, card payments and uh, paying on phones and getting internet and all that. And you know, it's not my field, but um, it's a lot easier if you're taking card payments, especially when we had COVID. So COVID gave us the control of the fields we needed, really, booking in systems and people were getting overwhelmed before blocking motorways and that, and that doesn't happen now. You can have 25, 50, you know, 100 cars an hour, but um, you, you don't get a million cars in an hour and block the M6 like we used to. So um, COVID was a big out for the um, management of fields and in soft fruit and in pumpkins. Now that will be going forward the future because you can charge people to um, make the book in and half of them don't turn up and they can also put a half the charge of the pumpkin which they can get back uh, on the um, booking fee so it works you know it's just win 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 very good okay next one well this is the covid stuff now you know we can manage footfall avoiding the congestion we've had trouble with the police you know we blocked the m4 the m6 and the m53 so we can't keep doing that and um you can you know you if you get a really good um website you can more or less sell all your pumpkins from your website if you haven't then you've got to do instagram facebook and whatever these other things are and um people seem to take a lot of notice of them and that's what they base their weekend on what the phone's saying to them right must be the last one ish now, isn't it? Yeah, this is just a um, few random snaps of um, how you can present pumpkins, really. So, that you got the bloke who puts the board up in the road, and oh, that's it. And then you got the people that's you know hire a professional carver and make bird boxes, and then the bottom right is a trailer ride, <coughs> which is often charged for as well. Very good, <laughs> that's brilliant, Chris. Listen, um. Great stuff. You've given us a really good uh, thorough overview of, of of every aspect of pumpkin production. It's just what look. It's you, you followed the the writing instructions we gave you to the to the T. So uh, you know, appreciate appreciate what you've done. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've 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 kept you a, a long time, but we do have a few. You know, in fairness to the people who have submitted questions, if they don't mind. There's a couple we've we've dealt with most of them, Chris. But there's um, there is a there's a couple I'd like to just uh, fire at you, Chris, before we 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 we, we close things down. Yeah, great um, stuff. Yeah, there's one here about if a pumpkin has fusarium in it, how long is it before it would show in storage? Um, it would be um, uh, 10, 10 to fourteen days, and what the first sign of it you would see would be like um, somebody sprinkled pepper over the whole thing, like small sunken black spots. Okay, right. Oh, then you're in trouble. You know, that's worry time. Yeah, there's nothing you can do at that stage then. Not really. Not few, well, you know, fusarium mm-hmm. from asparagus and bulbs and that. It's it's, it's yeah. a right thing. It makes a mess. Yeah. Any advantage using fungicide treatment before transplanting in the field? I've never heard of it, but I'd be interested in it. I'd be interested in, um, I've always been interested in the, the scope of putting fungicides and insecticides in modules. And I right. think pumpkins, you could, you could, but I don't know about it. If I, if I had some money or I got some money from my HDB, that would be one thing I'd look at. 
We didn't say you didn't talk much about pests. We don't worry too much about pests on the crop, do we, Chris? Um, apart well, from the slugs. Very, very rarely we get a bit of melon cotton, but that's all. Right. Very, very rare. Would slugs be something <laughs> you'd be? Would, would you be... sort of forty farms? I only saw it on one farm last year. That um, you know, it's a bit difficult with insecticides mm. and pumpkins. You haven't got much, have you? Right, not. It's the same story. Um, what about slugs? Are slugs a uh, concern? Oh yes, yeah, slugs are a nightmare. So you've got to, you know, you've got to get on um, the same days you transplant with them. The you know the modern ferric phosphate slug pellets, the slugs and that, and they're they're, they're effective. So there's no excuse for having slugs in. But slugs can come in late on in a wet season, and you've got to be careful because they start grazing the skins up, and then they let rots in. So they'll, they'll eat a green skin, but not a yellow one. And they wouldn't touch the orange ones? No, the, the, the orange ones are starting to cure, but they'll bite the skin off the, the green and let the, you know, because they're after the sugar in them and uh, you get those big horrible Spanish ones and uh, they can do quite a lot of damage, especially on small scale sites with like grassy paths and stuff. Okay. Um, I have one final one, unless you have a couple um, any more that I've missed, Owen. Oh, there's one here about the use of serenade for powdery milja. Yeah, serenade's all right, bicarb's all right. You know, we're into now the what we call bioprotectants. That was a term invented yeah. by HTB, and they, they're all pretty good, you know. All, all, um, they all, I'm more familiar with them in soft root than pumpkins because we use a lot of them because we grow in everberries and we're spraying them, every, you know, twice a week. So you soon run out of options. But Amilo X and um, serenade, yeah, they all do some good. And, um, and we have serenade has some uh, activity against bacteria, so that might keep your rots down. Okay, and we have all those. There's there's clearance for the use of the, those bio products. Uh, the last one I see here, Owen, is there's a, um, a grower asking about the supply of ornamental gourd seed. Where would you go? Well, moles would be the best for that. Mole seeds. Right. They do all those stripy and green ones and half yellow and that. You know, they do a good range, but. Um, I, I think CN seeds do them as well, in the, but uh, they'll all be from the States. So it, it basically will be the same seed, so it doesn't matter where you get them from. Okay, excellent. Yeah, but, yeah. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Owen, have you any yeah. any any more no, that, there on your list? Uh, that's that's it, Andy. That's uh, that was there. That was the last one I think that I saw as well. Brilliant stuff. All right. Look. Um, okay. Look. We'll we'll we'll. Um, We'll, we'll draw a close, Chris. You've you've done a good night's work. And um, look, on behalf of everybody, and we've had a good crowd in the house tonight, which is always encouraging. And um, on, on behalf of everybody, could I thank you, Chris, for, for, for the excellent presentation. And just to say, it's it's been recorded and it will be put up on, on our YouTube channel in the next week or so. And there's a, a copy of the, the slide presentation that will be up on the website as well for anyone who wants to, to access that. So um, thanks very much again for engaging. Uh, we've had some really good uh, questions from people and that's always, that's what makes these meetings and these webinars and uh, that, that makes it easier for all of us. So um, look, without any further ado, I'd like to um, say thanks finally again to Chris and thanks Owen for your help there on the, on the uh, technical side. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and you learned something and until the next time, good night and um, God bless. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in. Cheers.